In this lecture, we are going to uh, cover the principle of virtual work. The principle of virtual work is a more convenient way for stating equilibrium equations. We will start by stating the principle of virtual work. First, for B particle. So, here is a particle, and there are some forces that apply to that particle. Call this F1, call this F2, and call something like this. F3, there can be many more. So Newton's, Newton's second law in the case of equilibrium states that the sum of forces acting on the particle should be equal to zero. So what it states is that the sum of forces, the resultant force, which is essentially sum of Fi, where Fi are the different externally applied forces on the particle is equal to zero. Okay, so in 3D, F has three components. In 2D, F has two components. So these are two equations that say, let's say if we're using a coordinate system X and Y, is that sum of X components of forces equal zero and sum of X components of Y components of forces also equal zero. Another way to state that a quantity is zero is to say that that quantity when multiplied by any arbitrary value would give a zero. This property holds only for zero. And as such, if we imagine, and we're talking here about purely imaginary displacement of the body, and that vector of displacement, because it is imaginary, we're going to call that delta u. Then if we multiply the dot product of f and delta u, and if equilibrium holds, we get zero, regardless of the choice of delta u. So if equilibrium holds, then the work done by the resultant force on any arbitrary small displacement of the body, delta u is equal to zero. On the other hand, if we start from this statement here and start from f dot delta u is zero for arbitrary delta u, it's very important the word arbitrary here, yeah? Then what we get is Since delta u is arbitrary, we can always choose delta u to be proportional to a vector with components 1, 0, 0. So if we do the dot product and equate to 0, of course, this is not a vector here. Yeah? Excuse me. So if you do the dot product equate to zero, what you're going to get is that the x component of the force is equal to zero. You can choose delta u also in the direction of the unit vector in y direction, in which case dot product will tell you that if y equals zero, and if you are in 3D, you can assume also another arbitrary displacement which is in the direction of z and this will give you that fz equals zero and these three together tell you that f equals zero.
So we can state the principle of virtual work in the following way. A particle is in equilibrium under the action of forces if and only if it is both a sufficient and a necessary condition for equilibrium that the work done by the forces on any arbitrary virtual displacement is zero. Yep, so the principle of virtual work states that a sufficient and necessary condition for equilibrium is that x both delta u is zero for any choice of delta u, where delta u is a small arbitrary displacement of the body, which we call a virtual displacement. Instead of writing f dot delta u, we can, in matrix form, we can write this as f transpose delta u equals zero, or equivalently, since it is a scalar, we can write this as delta u transpose f equals Zero. Now that we have the principle of virtual work for a single particle, we can start thinking about the system of particles. And there are two possibilities for a system of particles. Either these particles are independent from each other, in which case the total virtual work is simply the work done, the virtual work done on each particle and you sum them over. So, principle virtual work for the system of particles So, if you have two particles, let's call this particle one and this particle two, and the resultant force on particle one is F1, and the resultant force on particle two is F2. So, we can write the virtual work done for the system of these two particles as F1 transpose delta U1 plus F2 transpose delta U2. And the condition of equilibrium is that W equals zero. So W is the virtual work of, um, of the system. Of course, since these two particles are completely moving independently of each other, delta U1 is independent from delta U2. There is no relation between the two. And as such, we end up with the conditions of equilibrium will be F1 equals zero and F2 equals zero. So the net force acting on each body particle in the body is going to be zero. And this is a consequence of our assumption that these two bodies are independent, move independently from each other. 
So this is the first case. The second case is when the particles are constrained to move in a particular way with respect to each other. So the simplest thing is a rigid connection. So let's say <coughs> these two particles are connected with a massless rigid link such that the distance between the two cannot change. And then we have a net force S1 acting on the first particle and a net force F2 acting on the second particle. So how do we formulate the principle of threshold work? In order to formulate the principle of threshold work, we try to reduce this second case to the first case, which is particles which are independent kind of each, each, each other. So the way to do that is to assume that we break the link and create a free body diagram for each particle. So if this is F1, there is going to be some internal force needed in order to keep the distance between these two particles in uh, the same, the same always. So there is going to be some contact force are acting on the first particle and on the second particle apart from the external force there is going to be another contact force and by Newton's third law we know that these two forces will have to be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to each other so if this vector is r this vector is minus r very well. Now these two particles, we have a free body diagram, so we can actually write down the total work done by the system. And this is going to be F1 plus R transpose delta U1 plus F2 minus R transpose delta U2. Very well. And of course the condition of equilibrium is that we equal zero. No problems with that. Okay, now we can simplify this expression. So we find that the virtual work done over the system is composed of two parts actually. This is the first part, which is essentially identical to the case when the two particles were not connected and or constrained to be more precise. And this is just the virtual work done by the applied of the external forces. So this here is work done, virtual work done by external forces. But this is not all. We have terms involving R. And the terms involving R are R transpose delta U1 minus delta U2. And what this says is that there is a work done here by the internal forces. And this work done by the internal forces depends on the relative motion of particles because the constraint here is on the relative distance between, between particles. Okay, very well. So, what uh, can we do from here? Can we further simplify this expression? Actually, we can. But before we do that, we just consider another case of particles which are not connected by a rigid link but by an elastic spring. So let's say that you have 
a situation where you have an elastic spring K connecting two particles. And we start at such a position. So automatically, and of course there are some internal for external forces applied, F1 and F2. Again, you will see that the same free body diagram applies as in the first case, except that we know that R will have a very specific form, and that form is going to be that R is proportional to the relative motion in x direction. So R is going to be equal to K, where K is the spring uh, constant. times u1 x, which is the x component, minus u2 x. And again, we will end up with the total work done. And of course, this is rx and ry equals 0. And the total work done, again, is r transpose delta u1 minus delta minus delta u2. OK, so now let us consider the constraint case and see what happens. In the constraint case, what we will have is R transpose delta U1 minus delta U2. And we need to ask ourselves what this value simplifies to in the case of a rigid link. In the case of a rigid link, to understand how it works, consider a roller support. And let us say that we have an x-axis in this direction and a y-axis in this direction. We know for the roller support that we only have a vertical reaction. And the reason for that is that the vertical displacement is always zero. So if you assume a vertical displacement of the roller, the virtual displacement, in order to be compatible with the constraint, will never have a non-zero vertical component. So the second component, which is the y component, will always be zero. So delta u, in this case, will always look like some constant in x, but zero in, in y. On the other hand, the reaction force on the roller would always have a zero component in X and a non-zero component in, in Y. So if you take the top product of the two, you will have that R transpose delta U equals zero. And this is pretty much the case with all constraints. And this is a fundamental um, idea in mechanics, that if you have a constraint that says a certain two particles have to move with respect to each other in a certain way, and the easiest way, of course, is distance is constant, the reaction force will be such that the total virtual work done by the internal forces are equal to zero. So this is going to be equal to zero for rigid connection. Yes. And just from there, we can easily deduce that R will be along the line connecting the two particles. If the virtual work is zero, then the only way this is going to happen is that 
R should be along the line connecting the two particles. So R is aligned with the line connecting the two particles. And delta U1 minus delta U2 has zero component. along the same line. Of course, this second condition here is a geometric condition. And it comes from the fact that the length of the connecting line should not change if we induce small virtual displacement. And the only way that the length of the line wouldn't change is that the x component, if the two particles are aligned along the x like this, the x displacement of the first particle and the second particle has to be equal. And as such, the relative motion in x is zero. And as such, but the relative motion in y can be now zero. And as such, the only non-zero component of R, in order to satisfy that the internal work done by the internal constraint force is zero, is going to be in the y direction, in x direction. Because, so essentially, R will take the form R and zero, and delta U1 minus delta U2 will take the form of zero and some constant which can be anything. So essentially, these two particles can move with respect to each other only perpendicular to the line connecting the two particles in order to maintain the condition that the distance between the two is constant. In which case, since the internal work is zero, then we can write W, which is the total virtual work, to be the virtual work done by external forces plus internal forces. In this case, this is zero. So this is going to be nothing but the work done by external forces. And this has to be zero. So what's the difference between this and the case of non-connected particles? The difference is that now, instead of having delta U1 and delta U2 completely arbitrary, so in 2D, we would have four arbitrary displacements, the X displacement of both particles is constrained to be the same, and as such, we have only three independent equations this time. So, to sum up, in the most general case of the principle of virtual work, the total virtual work is the work done by external forces plus the work done by internal forces, and the virtual work done by internal forces. Under displacements, virtual displacements delta u that satisfy bunch of conditions. The first condition is arbitrary. Two small in the sense of infinitesimally small. And three, compatible with 
with geometric constraints. So, and for rigid bodies, W internal equals zero. So the virtual work done by internal forces equals zero. But for the formable body, the work done by internal forces is not equal to is not equal to zero. And the condition of equilibrium is W equals zero. And this is, again, a sufficient and necessary condition for equilibrium. Now we can start um, our discussion of the main topic, which is principle of virtual work for deformable bodies. And in order to derive the principle of virtual work for deformable bodies, we start from a certain body in equilibrium under a combination of forces. There will be some traction forces on the surface of the body. There will be certain regions of the surface of the body where the displacement is constrained. And there will be internal forces acting through the volume. We describe the internal forces by the vector V, which is body force per unit volume. And we describe the surface loading by a traction distribution T, which is force per unit area. OK, that's all very, very well. OK, now we start moving uh, forward and formulate the work done by the external forces. The work done by the body forces is going to be an integration if we call the domain of the body omega and the boundary of the body delta omega. So it would be integration over volume of B transpose delta U dV. It's very important to understand that the virtual displacement is not a displacement of the whole body. So it's not like we assume that the whole body moves up or down or left or right. No. What we do is we assume an arbitrary displacement of every particle in the body. Because this is a deformable body, so there is nothing that constrains the different particles composing the body to move in the same direction, in the same distance. No. They can deform. The body can deform, so they can change the relative position. So delta u, in this case, is no longer a vector with three components, which are just arbitrary constants. No, this is a vector of three arbitrary functions. So at each point, they can have a different, a different value. And that's why you don't just find the net force due to the body force and multiply this by single delta u. Delta u is a function of space. It depends on the position of the particle. Okay, 
And what about the work done by the section forces? Well, where displacement is constrained, in this area here, that we are pointing out, in order to be compatible with the constraint, then we know that delta u will be equal to zero. In this region. But the traction, the reaction at this point are unknown. But the total work done when we multiply the attraction by displacement over this part of the body is going to be here. So we can just integrate over the part of the body which is not constrained and calculate T transpose delta U D area. Where T D area is the force because traction is force giving it area, so T D area is the force. You multiply that by displacement, virtual displacement and sum, and this gives you the virtual work done by the traction force. So this integral, this second integral is over the surface, and we need only to worry about the part where the displacements are not, are not specified, and as such, we can easily evaluate that. So it's straightforward to evaluate the vertical work done by the external forces. What about the vertical work done by internal forces? In order to, to figure out the work, the virtual work done by internal forces, we are going to simplify the expression for the work done by the traction forces. And so here is the work done by tractions. is equal to integration over the boundary T transpose delta U D area. If you remember our lecture on stresses, stress was defined from the relation that traction equals stress times normal vector. And the stress itself is in symmetric tensor. So if we calculate T transpose delta U, this is equal to N transpose. Sigma transpose is equal to sigma. You multiply this by delta U, which is the same as delta U transpose sigma n, because it is a scale. OK. So let us substitute this in the expression for the work done by the traction forces. This will give us integration over the boundary. Sigma times delta u all transpose n d area. Yeah. So essentially we write this as sigma delta u all transpose and we keep in mind that sigma is a symmetric tensor so sigma transpose equals sigma. Okay, very well. And in this form, this is now in the form of the divergent theorem. So we can write this as an integration over volume of the divergence of the vector dotting the normal, which is sigma delta u e form. Okay, so now we will need a vector identity 
which is not difficult to prove. It is equivalent, essentially, to the product rule uh, of uh, differentiating multiplication. If you have a, a tensor multiplying a vector like this, the divergence is nothing other than the divergence of the tensor dot delta u. So this transpose delta u plus the dot product of the tensor with the gradient of delta u. Of course, the reason why we have double dots here is that this is a dot product of two matrices, which is equivalent to the multiplication of each element of one of these by the corresponding element of the other matrix and summing over all the elements. So we can now write this in the following form. Okay, that's quite straightforward. From here, we can simplify the expression of W external. First, we add the work done by the volume forces plus the two terms representing the work done by traction forces, which is where the gradient of delta u is the displacement gradient due to delta u. Now we can combine the first two terms together in the form And we know this is going to be zero from equilibrium because equilibrium equation stated that the divergence of sigma plus b equals zero. So in order to exploit such effect, we are going to move the last term to the left-hand side. So we end up writing that w external minus integration of sigma the gradient of delta u dv equals. And for equilibrium, we know this is going to be equal to zero. But we know that, that the principle of virtual work states that w external plus w internal is zero for equilibrium. And from there, we find that the virtual work done by internal forces is nothing other than minus integration over volume of the dot product of stress and the displacement gradient of the virtual forces. Very nice. Okay, so can we simplify this any further? Actually, we can. And the reason for that is, if you remember, this is the 
displacement gradient, which we call H, but instead of the displacement gradient due to actual displacement U, this is the displacement gradient U due to virtual displacement. And we have said before that H splits into two parts, a symmetric part, which we call string, and since H is due to virtual displacements, we're going to write this delta H, and it will split into a symmetric part delta epsilon plus a screw symmetric part delta C. It's not difficult to see that since sigma is a symmetric tensor, that the dot product of sigma and delta C would always be equal to zero. And as such, we can state that the work done due to internal forces, the virtual work done, is nothing other than sigma dot delta epsilon dv. So we're talking about integration of stress times strain, but this time instead of stress times strain as scalars, stress times strain as tensors, with a minus sign over the volume of the body would give us that work done by the internal forces in the body. So let us just look at the work done by internal forces in a little bit more detail in 2D we know that our strain tensor is given by epsilon x gamma xy over 2 gamma xy over 2 and epsilon y and our stress was given by sigma x, tau xy, tau xy, and sigma y. As we said, the load product of two tensors like this is you multiply each component by the corresponding component and sum over. So we start by the components on the diagonal. These are quite easy. We get sigma x. Of course, if it is virtual, we can add deltas to everything. Delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y. Then the all diagonal terms will give us two terms which are identical. So when you simplify, you will find that the dot product of sigma and delta epsilon is nothing other than sigma x delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y plus tau xy delta gamma xy. And this is actually the reason why people define shear strains with a factor of 2 on the diagonal in the first place, such that uh, this expression is such a simple one. So in 3D, of course, we will have more terms. So we will have three diagonal terms, which will give us sigma x delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y plus sigma z delta epsilon z. And then we will have three shear uh, terms. And these three shear terms, which come from the off diagonal, will be such that 
the ordering of shear, as I said before, you start with the shear that doesn't have x in the subscript. So you start from tau yz, delta gamma yz, then the shear that doesn't have y in the subscript, so tau xz, delta gamma xz, and finally tau xy, delta gamma xy. So fundamentally in 3D, we, instead of writing stress and strain as tensors, we can sometimes write them as vectors. These are not physical vectors anymore, but it's just a matter of convenience for um, using matrix operations on stresses and, and strains. In which case, the stress vector will look like sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, tau y z, tau x z, and tau x y. And the strain vector is going to be epsilon x, epsilon y, epsilon z, gamma y z, gamma z x, which is x z, doesn't matter, and gamma x y. And the work done by internal forces would be minus integration sigma transpose times delta epsilon as a vector. And this is pretty much all what we need to know about, uh, about virtual work. We are going to um, have some applications later in terms of plate theory and beam theory, but then um, the main thing to remember is that total virtual work is virtual work done by external forces plus internal forces, and the work done by internal forces is just an integration of sigma transpose delta epsilon over the volume with a minus sign.